Okay, we're on. It's dun, live. Dun, dun, dun. Start again. <laughs> it's live from the table, the official podcast of New York's world famous comedy seller coming at you on Sirius XM, Raw Dog 99, and on the Ridecast Podcast Network. Dan Natterman here with Noam Dorman, owner of the world famous comedy seller, Imperial Ashen Brand, our producer. And tonight we have with us one of the. Uh, one of the legend. comedy fellow regulars. Huh? Nothing. Well, you're more than just a regular. You're a legend. You're part of the history of the club, the very uh, uh, fabric, the, the, the very, the walls of the club impregnated with your, with, with your, um, with your wisdom and genius. Colin, Colin Quinn is with us. And he, you know him, uh, the, the, you know him from Saturday Night Live. You know him from his numerous one-man shows, An Irish Wake, among others. And he has a new book out called Overstated. It's a coast-to-coast -coast roast of the 50 states. Please welcome Colin Quinn to our show. Title by, the title of my book was by Phil Hanley. <laughs> was it really? Yeah. No. Really? At the cellar table, he said it to me. How about Overstated? I was like, oh, Phil, it takes a Canadian to, to name a uh, American book. <laughs> well, Go ahead, Dan. I know that I've seen you, Colin, since before the uh, the pandemic. So yeah. I don't think I have. Maybe I have. No, you haven't. W were you at Rachel's birthday party last night? By the way, I wasn't there. But I was not there. Okay, Rachel Feinstein had a birthday, and uh, I didn't go. But uh, I thought maybe Colin. Anyway, uh, no. Do you want to start off with the book or with the uh, with the uh, debate last night, which everybody's talking? The book. The book. Colin's book. The book. We'll get to the debate later. Okay. Well, overstated. Uh, a coast to coast roast. So let's uh, let's hear a little bit more about it. Oh Jesus! I don't know. I mean, you know. I mean, it's basically each state I go through. You know, as you know, as traveling comedians, I've been to forty seven of the fifty states. I'm sure you have a similar record. And so I just said, let me write a book where I just, you know, basically go through all the states as we get ready for this breakup of a country, you want to kind of go do a meditation on what each state's personality is, what they meant, what they were, how they got around and how they are now. So that was basically it, you know. Well, you did, was, I assume was based because I saw your one, last one man show wherein at the end of the show, yeah. you did a, a quick rundown of the 50 states. I assume this is that idea, but in greater detail. Yes, exactly. Those were one liners. This is like, you know, a chapter in each one. Well, but it's Colin, basically, yeah. Oh well, no, Colin wrote this book. I don't know, like. I mean, he started this show writing about two, three years ago already, right? And and you had this dumb idea that the country was coming apart, like there was some real dissension and that uh, some tension. And and events have not worn it out, Colin. Things are things are harmonious as ever. What were you <laughs> thinking? I mean, it really, it really is gonna break up. I mean, I can't imagine unless something catastrophic happens or just like a supernatural event there's no because no one's like really a global pandemic <laughs> no, no i thought that was gonna i thought that would have an effect it shows how bad it is right and um yeah i guess my i guess i mean like meteors you know a meteor attack because um an outside attack is the only way you could unify i guess like an independence day in the movie with will smith yeah but there was nobody left Colin, is, are the, are the, the divisions uh, that we have are not necessarily as clean as they were back in 1861, where the, some, some states were slave states, some states were... That's right. Slave. Now there's division between, within a state, within a household. Well, within, um, you know, I mean, it brings to mind, not to keep being cheerful, it brings to mind Bosnia, when it was sort of the, the uh, rural against the cities, you know, in the 90s. And for that matter, Rwanda, when it was, you know, it was Hutu and Tutsi, but it was also the Tutsis were more, the Hutus were more rural and the Tutsis were more village, city type people. So, so Colin, in all seriousness, how would you see... Did you think I was joking when I brought up Rwanda and Bosnia? No, but I'm asking like, like you hear a lot of people thinking about how, you know... Like in all seriousness. The country could really come apart. And I'm wondering, like, how, what would that actually look like? 
Like, would, would we we actually fight, or what would happen? Yeah, I mean, right now it's a it's a it's a war of the phone, you know. <laughs> but I mean, uh, I can I can imagine it being like a, a place you may be familiar with, a little place I like to call the West Bank. Ah, you know, where people live together, but these things happen. I don't think that Noam. I don't think we have the stomach for for some reason in 1861 war seemed more palatable to people. I guess they were used to dying young. But now we're, we're a little bit too pampered. I don't think that anyone's going to be willing to go to war to save the Union. I would imagine if a serious secession movement came about, we'd, at this point, we'd just say, OK, goodbye and good luck. No, but what we're saying is, what if it's not a secession? What if it just breaks out into skirt? I mean, like the West Bank. You know what I'm saying? Where people are living, fighting. There's different groups fighting, you know, I mean, over. West Bank's a good example, actually, because you got, you know, Hamas and Fatah, and you got the Palestinian, um, you know, the, the uh, Palestinian Authority, and then you've got two different groups in Israel, you know what I mean? So it's like constant fights, but not really, in, not really anything that ever gets settled or, or gets declared, you know? Are, are you, do you actually think it would happen? Um, I don't know, but, I, you know... Look, I wasn't really answering like uh, I was I was on the spot and I had to come up with what it would look like. So I just threw that out there and I thought Noam is going to bite into this and I won't have to say another word the rest of the show. No, I, but I, but I, but because I think you I mean, I think I've heard you. And other, other, there are people out there who really think it could happen that we that we could really have. I really think we could. Yes. Yeah. But I'm just saying I didn't say West Bank. I said West Bank, which was basically like putting the carrot on the carrot, stick. Right, here you go. I figured I'd just sit back for the next hour like this. You don't know post-pandemic, no. I'm, I, I'm chill now. I don't, I, don't, I don't go for those things anymore. Was, <laughs> the West Bank? I mean, if I can't Nothing. Get means nothing. I feel nothing. <laughs> um, so I, I don't actually think, I, actually, I don't actually think we're going to go to war with each other, but I think it can become just horrible, like just a, a, a dysfunctional, like a bad marriage before people actually did get divorced. Like just, right. you know, just horrible, just fucking yeah. horrible. Is yeah. it already like that? Yeah. It, it can get worse. I say that in the book. I say it's a bad marriage, you know, where people keep, and what do you do in a bad marriage? You go, oh, they'll change and nobody ever changes. Oh, they'll, we got married too young and now we're fighting over money. It's a bad marriage. What are the what are the big? I think one of the big big uh, issues of discord, I guess, would be abortion, right? So sure. I read that most Americans actually are kind of on the same page with abortion. They believe it should be, you know, available, but not necessarily unrestricted. Say it's but, legal and rare, right? But but you know, it, it, to what extent are are the divisions real, and to what extent are they amplified by the loud mouth on Twitter? And to what extent, like, gun control is another big issue, and yet I've also read that most Americans are willing to compromise on that. Right. Well, I don't think it's, when you say loud mouths on Twitter, that's the American, that's us. That's the American people. So, yes, there's extremists on both sides that are, but those extremists seem to lead for whatever combination of reason. They're not, they're not going to not lead these debates. They're not going to not set the tone unless we decide to, you know, do something about it. All the people, the extreme middle, as it's called, you know what I mean? So, I mean, until, until, we, until something changes, those are the people that set the agenda in society. Very, very, uh, very bad time. And, and you also talked a lot about, I forget how you intertwine them, but in the show, you talked a lot about uh, political correctness and, and the uh, being imposed on comedy. Uh, how, do you, how do you see that relationship? Well, I mean, you know, in the book, I talk about like Massachusetts, how the Puritans are the social justice warriors are direct descendants of the Puritans that came over. I'm, it's sort of, a, I connect everything to our genetic and our personality. So I talk about how they, you know, the heresy and the shunning and all of that kind of stuff that you see today came about in Puritan days and became social justice warriors from Puritans to fundamentalist Christians, to social justice warriors, you know? And, and all these people um, that you're describing, they, they take a certain glee in all this, right? They're actually just bullies, really, in the end. 
I, yeah, I think so. I think it's people, yeah. I think it's people that, uh, that become what they hate. You know what I mean? Things always start out with uh, well intentions, but they always end up, let's say, that's why Animal Farm, people talk about 1984, but Animal Farm is very underrated too. I haven't because, read that. Well, that was the one where he really, uh, you know, they, they start out, that, I guess that's the French Revolution. I think it's con the communist um, Bolshevik revolution. That it I thought the other one, was, yeah, I guess they both were both, right? But anyway, the same pattern forms. All I know is with Animal Farm is, had I not read the Monarch Notes, I would have just thought it was a book about animals on a farm. Well, <laughs> they gave it to us to read in eighth grade as if we were really supposed to make that connection. Maybe no, 10th grade, whatever it was. We're much too young to realize what the hell they were talking about. But the Monarch Notes cleared everything up for us. But the, Dan, if a guy like you is reading Monarch Notes, then what hope is there for a society? See, here's the problem. A guy like Dan should never have read Monarch Notes. If this was... If you were born 50 years earlier, you would have grown up a walk up in the Bronx and then probably off Fordham Road somewhere, City College, but you would have been studying on the train. You didn't care that all the greasers were making fun of you. That would be, you wouldn't even think of Monarch Notes. I don't think Monarch Notes even existed back then. You would have what? been a, a scholar on Orwell. Right now you'd be schooling us on the nuances of Orwell, Orwell's books that we never read. You, over, you, you overrate Dan. Um, but uh, <laughs> uh, it's funny because you say that, Dan, because I, I, in, in high school, they, we were signed from Hemingway, like Sun Also Rises. Right. I remember, and I got the modern. I was thinking, well, I, this is totally uninteresting to me. And then I read it um, much more recently, like five years ago, I read The Sun Also Rises and The Great Gatsby. And then yeah. I realized they had no business giving this to a high school kid. Everything there is adult. And by the way, it's also written at a time where they don't even spell it out. So you actually have to be adult and live through it to see what they're even talking about. References to erections and sex and yes. it, 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 was, I, it was just a boring story in high school. No, you're, you're right. And Dan, you're, you're making Dan's point. Dan's saying the same thing, that they give us these books when we're too young to really understand what's happening, you know? And uh, yeah, Sun Also Rises, well, it's, like, it's like a bullfighter. The guy's a bullfighter and then he's having an affair and one of them beats up the other. I still can't remember, but I was like, at the time, I was like, a bullfighter is just like a made up profession. I didn't know what that was. It, you know? it, it, it's, and by the way, so, so just the other thing about the social justice warriors. Um, so it's related. I keep calling her Elizabeth Barrett Browning. It's Amy, Amy Coney Barrett, right? The new, the new Supreme Court justice. Right. Well, let's call her Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Um, so she, she's adopted two young Haitian. She has two young um, uh, Haitian uh, children that she adopted. Um, I guess they were victims of the, the earthquake there or something like that. And like uh, Ibram Kendi, you know, the guy who wrote How to Be an Anti-Racist and various other people on the left are attacking her for having adopted these black children. They're full of hate. And it's like, it, you really begin to wonder, I could actually, I'm sure, give you an excerpt from Richard Spencer, the white supremacist. Right. And give you an excerpt from Ibram Kendi and if I just didn't mention the colors, you wouldn't know who was who. The right. logic is exactly the same. Well, that's what they always say about the extremists always end up on the same. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, and, I mean it's just what's going to become of that in America where, and we've all, except for Periel, we all grew up, you know, people will say, oh, you just think that way because it's when you grew up. But it's true. We grew up at the time when the, when the goal was to make race as irrelevant as it could possibly be. Right. And now the goal. Well, de, to make it so that it would, not that it's irrelevant, but that there's no strict protocol that you had to follow if you decided to be a human being with, who lived in a world with other races. Well, I think, I mean, I won't quibble over the word, but, but I think irrelevant. I heard Sam Harris say like, you know, how, do you, who can tell you how many blondes there are in the military? This is nobody, because nobody thinks that matters. And we, we hope that that's what, that someday we wouldn't care. Who cares how many blacks there are? Right, Who cares right. how many whites there are in the NBA? Nobody notices that stuff. No, it, it's true. Yeah. yeah. That, um, and and now, that, the, now the goal is exactly the opposite. And if that's the goal, we're going to be at each other's throats. I mean, that's just the way it is. Well, I hate to, I hate to, uh, you know, go back to the beginning of this, but what do they call it? Balkanization. 
Buzz Dia. <laughs> and and the, the and the Hootsies and the Tootsies. And the Hootsies and the Tootsies. Hootsies and the Tootsies. And the tootsies. Like, it's not, say, it's not like Jerry Lewis. <laughs> Hootsie Tootsie. <laughs> Go ahead, Periel. You're right. Well, Periel's a woke. Well, Periel is a social justice warrior, by the way. So well, nice to have her here. I mean, it's a relatively benign one, and 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 not overwhelmingly um, uh, sanctimonious. <laughs> Um, I guess, thank you. I, I just wanted to hear what, other than the thing about the kids with Amy Coney Barrett, um, who, I mean, I don't know about these children, but other than that, I think that she's a complete nightmare. Of course um, you do. Well, there, there is a piece in The Guardian. I, I don't think they should be a, 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 a confirming a justice right now, don't get me wrong, but that's uh -huh. not to say that she's some sort of horrible person. Well, I mean, I, I throw this out there, which I pulled for this conversation. Um, Barrett, a federal, this is from The Guardian, so let's start there. A federal appeals judge has declined to publicly discuss her decades-long affiliation with People of Praise, a Christian group that opposes abortion, and this is the best part, holds that men are divinely ordained as head of the family. Ooh. Well, somebody ought to tell her husband that because she seems to be the breadwinner. <laughs> Leaders teach that wives must submit to the will of their husband. Oh, come on. I don't believe any yeah. of that stuff. Wh Listen. Why not? Why don't you believe that? Because, because look at the woman. Because she's a federal just appeals court judge. Now she becomes Supreme Court justice. Does that sound like a homemaker? You can still be living in a nightmare personal situation. All right, Peggy Noonan wrote a long column like about- Tina Turner, She had Tina Turner. She's like the Tina Turner of the judicial system. <laughs> <laughs> Peggy Noonan wrote a column about this people of praise thing in the Wall Street Journal this weekend. And she, she just debunked most of it. It's all a bunch of malarkey. I mean, they're, they're religious Christians. They're, they have a right, but- um, No, no, and those, I know a lot of those Christian types, they do say, that the man is the head of the house, so they say that. Yeah. You know what I mean? And um and they're anti-gay and they're anti-gay marriage. Yeah. And you know, they it's would, they well, would I, I assume I assume my definition. It's I true, my, but it but I think it's also a mark of what you just said at the left, which is I don't know about these children. You do know about these children. He just told you. So let's not pretend that he she isn't being wait, wait, wait. Let me just say, I'm Roy Innes. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> that on the left, what they do a lot of times is when they get their extremists who are just as bad as the right extremists saying things like attacking somebody for having Haitian children, they go, I don't know about that story. Of course you know about it. He just told it to you. Okay. So saying, There's no condemnation. Wait, wait. No condemnation on the left when these kinds of things happen. And I feel like guys like us would be more reasonable to go, oh, you're on the right. They're psychos. Okay. So I only said, I don't know about these children because I haven't read about that part, but I can say the only thing I can say about the children is that it's very unfortunate that she's probably indoctrinating them to hate gay people. But is it less for, <laughs> <laughs> but, but better they're indoctrinated than, you know. In a home, at least they have a home. Yes, to be indoctrinated to, but. That was a good one. <laughs> I, 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 I'm skeptical that they're being indoctrinated to hate gay people. They might be perhaps indoctrinated to uh, feel that marriage should be between a man and a woman. Um, I don't think they're being indoctrinated to hate gay people. You know, say, you know what they say in Haiti? Not Adam and Eve, yeah, Adam and Eve not Adam and Eve, Y-V-E-S. <laughs> <laughs> I'll read you a little excerpt here from the Wall Street Journal since Perriel's up, got her, you know, her panties in a bunch or whatever that expression is. Whoa! Um, <laughs> Joanna Clark, a local leader, people of praise in Portland, and the head of the Trinity Academy, a people of praise school, also appears to be failing at submissiveness. I consider myself a strong, well-educated, happy, intelligent, free, independent woman, she laughs. She has a doctorate from Georgetown. Trinity's culture is distinctly Christian, but purposely ecum ecumenical. The emphasis on reading, writing, and Socratic inquiry. Our three pillars are the humanities, modern math, science, and the arts. Music and drama, do they teach evolution? They do. We are normal people. There's women who are nurses, doctors, teachers, scientists, stay-at-home moms. We are in the Christian community because we take our faith seriously. We are not weird or mysterious, she laughs, and we are not controlled by men. 
Okay, so that, you know, can I counter that? Uh, no, let's move on. So, <laughs> no, can we get to the debate? I mean, that's a pretty big. Uh, pretty Let me just say this and then yeah. I'll be done. Quote People of Praise was formed in 1971 by Kevin Ranigan and Paul DeSellis. Both men were involved in the Catholic charismatic renewal in which Pentecostal religious experience, such as baptism in the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues and prophecy are practiced. Okay, you know what? You might as well take Jesse Jackson up on the same bullshit because do you know what goes on in the Black Baptist churches? You always Come on now. You always have Come on now. Only, only white people are gonna get called out for this stuff. This is this is religion. And by the way, that that's very close to the argument about how like the, the, the Republic, you know, the Democrats were the party of uh, slavery and Jim Crow. I mean, who knows what happened? I don't know what or, or the I mean, I don't know what 1971 founding had to do with it, but there's no evidence that this woman is anything other than a genius. And there's been liberals who have worked with her writing columns in the Washington Post saying, I totally disagree with her on stuff, but she's more than qualified to be a, a justice. I mean, there's, what, what, it's enough already. I mean, again, I don't think they should be performing a justice now, but go ahead, Colin, go ahead. No, no, but I mean, either way, oh yeah. yeah. I, I don't like the fact that nobody even looked at my book. You guys haven't even glanced at my goddamn book. Yes, I don't have a copy of it. I mean, I'm, I'm about no, to put no, I'm to check, my the, check your chat. I sent you something in the chat. Oh, oh yeah, because I want now. <laughs> I don't have a. I, I, she she downloaded me. Uh, I don't have a um a copy of the book. How do how do I get a copy? That's true. I'll get you a copy. So well, no, I'm curious. Um, I I don't remember. Is it, is it, no, I don't. I mean, I'm asking for a freebie. I'm like, like, is it available on Amazon now? My people now, should have gotten you a copy. Are there any states where you felt like, I'm going to have to fudge this because this state really doesn't have that much of an identity <laughs> and I'm really going to have to just, uh, I'll come up with something, but it ain't going to be easy. I mean, New I York, actually, New York is the hardest one because I've done so much on New York that not repeating it was almost impossible. So I had to, I had to think of what I thought of New York in another way. Okay, so here we are. This is the, the, this is the very nice... Uh, who did the who did the cover art? Um, I don't know who did it, but it was my concept. It's pretty good. Hey, bones. Uh, although I didn't come up with the water going over the waterfall. I just said on the boat with the phone, so I shouldn't say the waterfall. That wasn't my, t you know. Yeah, they did a good job. If you include, I, I know it's a fifty states, but DC might soon be a state. I don't know if you I, include I included DC. DC. And okay. I think you guys will appreciate what I thought of. I can't remember the exact wording, which is funnier than I'm going to say. I'm ruining my book right now because I can't remember. But D.C., I talk about how people kind of, like our country understood you needed a place for backroom deals. That's why it wasn't a state. You needed to go talk to all the crazy people in your state and go, I'm going to take care of it. You don't want to know what happens. I'll get you jobs. I'll get you what you want. But it's going to cost you too and then go in, and when they were drinking and smoking, they would do backroom deals. And now, nothing gets done, because when you can't have a little bit of corruption, that's how it goes sometimes. That's amazing. Well, that's I, I, I really do agree with you, and it's funny because, man, this is the way to get into the debate. I've been having some conversations lately, and, the, and you see it better than ever now after the debate. Like, we really were better off when the candidates were chosen in a smoke-filled room. Well, that's exactly what DC is supposed to be, the nation. That's, I think I title it the nation's smoke-filled room. Exactly. I that's agree. That's amazing. You know? I mean, things, I mean, I mean can, you, can you believe what we saw last night in terms of this is the two best people that America could throw I was there? I was pleasantly surprised that it wasn't worse. I, 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 yeah, you know, really. um, I mean, I, I was thinking, first of all, Trump didn't, I mean, he was very insulting with, uh, to Biden, but I, at least he didn't call him Sleepy Joe. It was, it was, it was embarrassing. I it was agree. the it was, you expected anything different though? Nick DiPaolo would have been kinder. It was, what's that? Nick DiPaolo would have showed more forbearance than. <laughs> yeah, it was really, it's embarrassing. Nick DiPaolo would also probably be a better president. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so wait, wait, but by the way, just before we uh, do that, just um, let me just guys show you guys something that uh, my, uh, was in my daughter's Zoom class. Tell me what you think about this. This is what I pay my taxes for. This is what she's learning. Can you read that? 
Fairness or equity does not always mean equal. Fairness means treating people according to their needs. Oh boy, <laughs> hey, we all also, know that. That looks. That line sounds familiar. Also known as "from each according to need, to each according to their ability." Yeah, that's this, this is what they're not the Guardian, Perry L. I'm sure they get a copy of the manifesto on their desk before they do the editorials. This, I mean, that, wait, I have a question. Does the one on the left, the little guy, are there two eye holes through that fence for him? Let's, we'll assume okay. there aren't for the sake it's, of it's three. It's three people on the left. It, it's, they seem like African 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 American people. Right. And they're standing on boxes, and the littlest kid uh, is not tall enough. The box is not tall enough. So the dad, assume it's the dad, yeah. gives the other kid the boxes. So now they can all see over, which is, which is fine. Of course, that's, that's very simple. Now, what happens if there's not enough boxes to go around? That, <laughs> that's when it gets interesting. Why How do you it look decide? Like they're wearing yarmulkes also. No. But, uh, I mean, I, I have no problem with that. Uh, graphic in terms of you know being nice, but I do wonder what are they doing? Like, what is it? What does this have to do with reading, writing, and arithmetic? I mean, why do they think it's okay to be teaching my kids communist adjacent stuff? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not communist adjacent. That was right out of the <laughs> manifesto. That might be the most fair. That's lazy communism. They don't even bother with something original. They have to go with the most hacky line in all of communism. And what does it mean, fairness means treating people according to their needs? Are they saying that fairness means that you have to give somebody a spot at a college because they need it? What do you think it means? It's blatantly there. It's, it's marked. I mean, they couldn't make it clearer for you. If you can't see over the fence, you're supposed to get an extra fucking box. Well, is that right. what they mean? Or, is it, or do they mean that, uh, you know, if you don't have the intellectual skills to, to uh, make you know, as, as the same amount of money as somebody that's smarter than you, then you should get extra money. Um, look, let, let's be honest. These are, these are I mean, I, we'll, I have, we all have sympathy for uh, the idea of fairness and equity. And, and we all also realize that these are very, very, very tough questions as you try to implement them in various real life scenarios. Some of them are quite easy, like, the dad doesn't care because he can see anyway, right? That's the example. But and they're, these are fourth graders, and instead of they're just not ready for this. They're, they're brain at this age, it's brainwashing. In the tenth grade, they can teach them these concepts and and challenge them in various scenarios to work it out and and to understand the complexity of it. But at this age, they're just literally teaching them uh, stuff that they can repeat. A catechism is that what they call it in the church, column? Yes, catechism. catechism. Yeah. I um. I don't know if I entirely agree with that, but I do have a question. Colin, what, is there a state that like most surprised you in a pleasant way that maybe you, you had some like assumptions about or? No, I mean, but, but <laughs> the surprising facts was like when I, I was looking at a little bit of a, Little Rock, Arkansas, for example, and the famous, you know, the famous Little Rock, the kids in the school. And Paul McCartney wrote Blackbird, the song Blackbird. Of course. He was inspired by the Little Rock case. Oh, wow. So when I realized all these years, Charles Manson was right. The White Album, that song was on the White Album. The White Album was about a race thing. We owe Charles Manson an apology as a country. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. I figured out a way to get into the debate. Go ahead. What do you want to say about the debate? I was going to say you the better, way to say. You better have a lot to say about it, Dan. The way you've been chomping at the bit on this goddamn thing. Well, um, the the big story, the big issue. In fact, I got a a friend of mine from college that I will not reveal the name of. Uh, sent me a text saying. Um, that your boy, he called Trump my boy, because once or twice I defended something he said, not because I voted for him or plan to in the future. Right. He said, your boy said, told the Proud Boys to stand by. Are you proud of that? Proud to support that? So um, I felt that was a bit rattling, to be honest with you. I was very, um, that rattled me. What uh, that, the, the fact that I was accused, basically accused of, of having Nazi sympathies. Yeah. And, and, being, and being told that um, 
my boy, that Trump is my boy, and that I'm, am I proud of myself for supporting uh, his support of neo-Nazism? Yeah. When, when all I've done is here and there occasionally defended a particular thing he said or position that he's taken. I've told you to delete Ted Alexandro's contact, but you don't listen to me. <laughs> you know what, Ted, oh. is not, Ted is not that punishing. Um, I well, I was, I was about to say, I mean, it sounds like this person just is kind of an asshole. Maybe you should well, take their number out you know, of your phone. Well, this person is a dear friend and an old friend, and I, I just feel that <laughs> it almost doesn't make sense. Like, there's something weird going on with him, and, uh, you know, I'm, I, it seems to me that he's, he's something well, odd is happening with him, because this is not the person that I've known all these years, but, I, you know... Okay. Um, so Dan, so let, let me, let's read the transcript. Um, now, as I'm reading the transcript, I realized that they, it went by so fast that this transcript is not accurate, but I'll correct it from memory. And it says, Chris Wallace, uh, you have repeated, says you have repeatedly criticized the vice president for not specifically calling out Antifa and other left-wing extremist groups, but are you willing tonight to condemn white supremacists and militia group and to say that they need to stand down? Now, stand down is, I, I'm pointing out that word because I think that's where he tried to repeat it and not add to the violence in numbers of these cities we saw in Kenosha, as we've seen in Portland. Now, again, and to say, I don't, I don't know that Kenosha was white supremacist or, or Portland. I don't, I don't know white supremacist in Portland. But anyway, President Trump, sure, I'm willing to do that. So then, he, so then he, that wasn't enough for Chris Wallace. He could have left it at that. Are you prepared specifically to do it? I would, and then Trump says, I would say almost everything I'm seeing is from the left wing, not from the right wing. Talking about Portland, you know, I, I, that's not a ridiculous thing that Trump said. Chris Wallace says, but what are you saying? He says, I'm willing to do anything. I want to see peace. Chris Wallace says, well, do it, sir. And then Biden says, say it, do it. And Trump says, what do you, what do you want me to call him? Give me a name. Give me a name. Go ahead. Who do you want me to condemn? And then this is not in the transcript I'm reading, but then Biden says, proud boys. Okay. Biden says, proud boys. Right. And, and Chris Wallace at the same time says, white supremacists is the right wing militia. And then Trump says, proud boys, stand back and stand by. But I'll tell you what, somebody's got to do something about Antifa and the left because this is not a right wing problem, this is a left wing. So what I saw when I watched it, and I didn't realize it would be as significant as it was, is that they're, they're like badgering him and, he, and, he, and Biden says, proud boys, okay, proud boys, stop, stand back and stand by. It's not, it doesn't seem to me, although it's true if you read it, it sounds like he's saying, wait for my orders. Yeah, stand by. The issue is the word, the phrase, yeah. stand by. But it didn't seem to me at all like that's what he meant. Go ahead. But, but, but here's the problem. Here's the problem. But now he should correct it today. He needs to correct it today. No, his yeah. problem is this. He, yeah. he didn't correct it today. He, he said the same thing today. But oh, really? He, yeah. he didn't, he didn't I take it back then. By. I don't think he, he said, said He said, by. I never heard of the Proud Boys. Okay. Right? I mean, never heard of the fucking Proud But here's the point. Is that... He didn't have to be badgered if he had just said, I denounce white supremacy. Instead, he's like- He did. No, no. Well, no, you're right, you're right, he didn't, he didn't. He, his problem is he has no, he has no class. He doesn't have any class. And that was the problem in the debate last night. He's a low class guy. We've said, you've said the same thing to no, he has no class. He doesn't, he has no general, he doesn't know how to have a debate. He doesn't give it. He's one of those death-devouring figures. It's disgusting. Okay, I, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna tell you what, why I. Go ahead. You finish, Colin. I'm sorry. Forget about Republican or Democrat. I, you see it. He's, a, he's an apocalyptic guy. He doesn't care about Republican, Democrat. He only cares about destroying everything. That's his goal. He loves. He's the guy that loves to sit back and watch it fucking burn. And last night was a little bit of that. You yeah, know, he doesn't give a fuck. If he really gave a shit, even if he was lying, he would have said, I renounce those white supremacists. He doesn't care if this whole country kills each other. Okay, let, let, let me try to, uh, I, I don't want to defend him because he should, I mean, what's so hard? But, right. but yeah, he- How hard is it to say, I denounce white well, supremacists? Well, okay, because this is, what he, this is what I, if I channeled Trump, he would say the following. First of all, I've done that before. You, here's the quote, you've heard me. He said in Charlottesville, I'm not talking about the white supremacists, I condemn them unconditionally. Right. He's said it before. Second of all, Chris Wallace is talking about Portland, which is a bunch of left-wing crazy, and you're putting white supremacists on me. Number three, 
Number three, it's distasteful to have to denounce something because you've overlaid it on me when you when when I've done it already and and I'm Donald Trump and I and I fight back. That's that's, that's exactly it. That's fine. But part of being a president, a big part is trying to calm people down. Yes. And if you have to get, if you have to answer something, if you have to make a statement you made a few times before, that's a big deal. Just do it. So let me say. You're not supposed to be like, ah, fuck you. It's like, yeah, 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 that's great <laughs> for an individual. But when you're how holding a delicate country that's about to explode, could you just suck it up and just no, say let, it? Let me, sec let me separate the two issues because on the question of whether he's acting presidentially, there is no daylight between us. Obviously, he's not handling this right. Obviously, he's throwing fuel on the fire. I'm, I, what I'm inquiring into is whether or not this is proof that Trump is a white supremacist or whether or, or Trump is actually just a guy who says, fuck you to whatever you want him to do. Right. You, just yeah. briefly, would you say that stand by was a, was a, he misspoke when he said stand by? Uh, well, I mean, if you're telling me today he, he had the chance to, to take it back, and, and then I'm, you know, even though in my heart I, I do, I mean, it just sounded like he just came out with it without a moment's thought. Um, if he refuses to take it back, I'm not going to put my head on the guillotine and says, he, I mean, he, no. he's acting like he meant it, right? But I just want to remind you, Saddam Hussein didn't have weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> no, you're right. But every time they ask Trump about any of this stuff, they go, so anytime you hear him about any white surprise, he goes, eh. <laughs> I don't, I don't know what also, the, the matter with this guy. Didn't he also say something about like not conceding, even if he loses, like he encouraged his supporters? It really does bother, it really does bother me, however, that at a time when we're seeing constant violence in these cities, including in New York, we had scary nights. Absolutely. That, that we're, we're dredging up something that happened serious, something serious that happened from the white supremacy and, 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 and whether, whether it's something really should be right now, the fucking left wing violence. Ab absolutely, but guess what? Here's why he's such an idiot. Because if he just said, I denounce white supremacy unequivocally and completely, and by the way, most of it's happening on the left, but he can't even do that. And yeah. I'm telling you why, because subconsciously or even, this guy lives to see explosions. He's one of those people. There's people like that. And sometimes they get into position of power. He doesn't care about left, right, Republican, Democrat, economy. He doesn't care about any of that. He lives to watch shit burn down. Absolutely. Some people are like that and he's one of them. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And, and also he was his own worst enemy in the debate because there were so many he was interrupting so much that he didn't, there, there were fastballs over the plate he didn't even swing at. Absolutely. B Biden says, uh, I'm not going to answer wh whether I want to pack the court because that will become the issue. Oh, really? Because, well, you're running for president. I think, you know, like. Absolutely. Anything Trump you say, you're not going to answer a question because you don't want to make it an issue. Oh, he says, um, yeah. what was the other thing that he said that was, so? oh, he's blaming Trump for the economy. Right. And Trump said, well, Joe, I, I thought you were in favor of stricter lockdowns. Do you know a way to lock the country down further and not affect the economy? Maybe you should come work on our administration. We need the help. Like, what the fuck? And it was many things like this. That's what a thoughtful person would say. But like I said, I honestly believe he's driven by a different set of, uh, you know, compulsions than you would think a person in, in that position would. In well, any I, I, but is, I have an idea about it, though, though, and this also goes to his thing about the, the mail-in ballots and all that stuff. I think that he, he operates from a rule of thumb, and in his past life, this is not a stupid rule of thumb, which is to keep maximum pressure on the other side in every way that you can. Not that you know what's going to happen, but you know that if they're under pressure long enough, something will give, something will break, their cracks, their weaknesses will expose, you will fuck them up. So he is keeping maximum pressure in every way that he can on the left, on the Democrats. He doesn't know what's going to give, what opportunity is going to create for him, but he knows for a lifetime that it does create opportunities. But, almost, but the problem is, it's not a patriotic way for a president to behave. Because no. we're the victims of all. It's fine in business. It's exactly. fine in business. Because you just said it perfectly. He doesn't know what opportunity is going to create for him. Right. Because that's all this is. He's 
He's, I'm telling you, he's driven. He's not even driven by success in business. Do you, do you think a debate's really the best way to inform the public of the candidates' positions? Maybe they should just each get an hour of TV time where they answer questions and, to, and, and respond, you know, separate. Yeah. Of course. I mean, this isn't to really inform the public. I mean, this no. shit is like, just like no, a I, I don't agree. fest. I don't agree. First of all, we did learn something about Trump before. We, we kind of knew it. What did we, we learn? We, we learned how horrible he was. Did we not know that? Not, not, well. I mean, it was, it's I, think, I know a lot of people who are super clear on that before last night. Yes, yes. People, you, those people that you're referring to knew, <laughs> knew all this. You know, always. No, but, those, um, those, first of all, those people of The Guardian hate Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, too. There's no. nobody far left enough for them. No, I mean, I don't, I, look, I don't know. I mean, I'm saying, mind at all. Like, Kamala Harris is a cop. It's like, oh, imagine having a law enforcement person in society. That's a terrible idea. <laughs> No, but it sounds to me like you were driven even further into the Biden camp last night. I'm, I mean, you, you've said that you, if you had to vote, you'd vote Biden, but it, you didn't say with enthusiasm. Are you slightly more enthusiastic about that choice after last night? Well, I've told you this before. There, there are two timelines um, out there, and I don't know which is the right, less risky road to travel. The one timeline is a guy who is a loose cannon and, and um, uh, uh, can't, can't separate his impulses from his own, even his own self-interest, let alone the country's self-interest. And um, if he's president, he could do a lot of damage. But on a lot of issues, including the issues that matter most to me, which is protecting me and my business and um, fighting the woke and all that, he, he's aligned with me. I can't lie about it. And I'm, right. actually, I'm not even well, against controlling the border, to tell you the truth. Yeah, no, On the other hand, you have a guy like Biden, who clearly is a more decent guy and, and uh, is, is going to have you less, uh, what, what, uh, less tempestuous and, and uh, um, impulsive. And, but right. he may usher in a filibusterless left-wing uh, uh, smorgasbord you know feast and that scares the shit out of me so i don't know right that's a conflict. It, it's but, six and one half dozen the other to me well that's a conflict and i understand 100 percent what you're saying but you're not believing what i believe which is that trump is on a mission and it has nothing to do with anything we're talking about it has nothing to do with politics it has nothing to do with business it has nothing to do with even his own family it's a mission. It, Carl Young should moderate the debate. <laughs> Get to the bottom of this. And, and Israel, by the way, I'm, I'm concerned about Israel. So what I'm saying is that I'm gonna, I would support Biden because it seems to be the less risky by far choice. Yeah. But I don't say it with any assurance that after four years of Biden, I won't say, fuck, this is, this is even worse. Right. Because, right. because Trump, is, Trump has an expiration date. And well, this, think- and what? But this wokeness, left wing, ultra progressiveness, this can go on for 30 years. It's disgraceful. It's disgusting. I know what you're saying. I know the conflict. And I think a lot of people are going through it. What what do you think, Noam, of of Trump's? I know one thing, Dan. I got to say one thing. I know that when businesses were being burned down in this city, the the decent, smart people, like at the New York Times, were tweeting out things like, ah, private property can be replaced. That's right. To vote for that, to vote for that mentality, is really fucking difficult for me. That's a good point. Really difficult for me. Well, the good news is, Noam, is you're 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 going to do what you do every uh, election and not vote. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> private property can be replaced. I mean, what what an outrageous thing to say. Disgusting. Yes. Yeah. And by the way, they found some dead store owners at the bottom of some of these stores. But yeah. never mind. Just so people at home know, if oh, if, the, if my business were to burn down. It'd probably take five years with all the permits to get it rebuilt, maybe with the insurance money paying 80%. In that five years, I would have no income. Right. Once it is rebuilt, to reconstitute a business five years later after someone else has become the center, after everyone, someone else becomes the comedy seller, after Colin Quinn is hanging out at the fucking stand every night. <laughs> <laughs> five years, I'll be dead. I'll, so, be, I'll be a comedy seller, Boca. 
I mean, and, and, and the stress of it, all, Roca, yeah. and the stress of it all. And the, I mean, you're talking about- Not to mention you are, you know, not that anybody's terribly sympathetic to it, but you are uh, causing, you are stealing basically from the insurance company in a sense. I mean, you know, to the extent that anybody cares about the insurance company. Oh, yes, yes. You yeah. know. Yeah. Um, so what is your voting plan? I don't vote. <laughs> Yeah, it's tough. I was, I was really giving you an opportunity. Oh, and you, to, uh, I never vote. I never You vote. have to vote this year. It's like I, the most important election of your life. Well, I, I mean, I'm going to give you a civics lesson on Electoral College. It's actually not. It actually doesn't matter at all. No, no, no. It's not, it's not true. It's and you said an example. Matter. You have to vote in Wyoming. But, you're, you know, it's it's... I don't know. I, I, you know, I can't explain why you should vote because you're, you're right. It's not going to probably not going to matter. That's but not true. yet I feel in my heart you should vote and you're being uh, you're taking the easy way. Out. I don't like what it does to my head psychologically. It forces me to root and defend and become part of the team. I don't no, like it. Look, you don't have to do that. And you're all you also set an example for people who look up to you and admire you and God help them. But Colin, Colin, you vote. Yeah, I vote. And you it ain't easy. Me. It's not easy. Because yeah. every time I'm like, this is, the, I'm just committing suicide. Yeah, it's, it's not, you don't have to have fun doing it, but it's a really- You don't have to enjoy it. And you could be wrong and regret it the rest of your life. It's still the right thing to do. I mean, I've gone into the voting booth not knowing who I'm going to vote for as I'm walking into the booth. Uh, you know, that, that was the case with the first time with Obama because I felt that, um, I mean, at that time, I was upset with Obama and the Reverend Wright, you know, and that that whole thing. Yeah. Um, but I voted for him anyway. But but I really was walking to that booth thinking, God oh, damn America. I mean, even well, if you're- way, I'm, I'm happy about the Reverend Wright because it's such, a, it's such a beautiful example. So Obama, his mentor, his mentor who dedicated his book to, who married him and Michelle was this Reverend Wright who was hateful of America, hateful of Israel, had all these, said all these outrageous things about white people. And because it was Obama, nobody, nobody, you know, I shouldn't say nobody cared, he but he, he got away with it, he got a pass. He said uh, he fell asleep. Yeah, he didn't know, he didn't know every, he didn't go every, he went to his church every Sunday, but never noticed the guy's feelings. But Amy, Con, Amy Coney Barrett, she belongs to some sect that in 1970, somebody, the leader said this. Amy Coney Barrett. Who's an example to all women? If only all women me, behave like this. Listen to me. I don't care if you go into that voting booth and you write in Colin Quinn's name. It's better than not doing it. Seriously. But Periel, why do you have to say me like I'm the dumbest example? I don't care if you go, if you go in that voting booth and you write in Colin Quinn's name. <laughs> Yeah. Um, no. Good job, Periel. Any more? I would, vote, I would vote for you in a heartbeat, Colin. <laughs> I would feel so good about voting for you. I would much rather vote for Quinn than, than, than any of the, the two that we have. And I think uh, he's probably- If I thought he could win, but I just don't see it. I don't, th I don't think I have a chance. I think that if we, we could probably raise a pretty good campaign for you, I think you'd be surprised. I'd like to run for dog catcher. You know, they always say, <laughs> they couldn't win as dog catcher. Is there, a, is, is there a third party candidate? Joe Jorgensen, right? Is that is her name? A libertarian candidate? Libertarian. Joe Jorgensen? Was that her name? It's yeah, I think so. Hang on. Joe Jorg, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but um, spelled J-O Jorgensen. It sounds like a trans, uh, you know, person. And uh, he's 63, which is young, I guess, compared to the rest of the field. Yeah, Joe Jorgensen. Plus, it's that Scandinavian blood, they, they, they stay, you know, awake for a long time. That's, uh, if she's Dan Danish uh, extraction. Let's do Danish it. Danish American. There you go. I, I, uh, I would vote for Libertarian. I'd okay. such a waste of time. Look at how far he's come. This is a major, major thing. Who's come? Oh, no. I don't yeah. want to vote. I'm you know what? You're just going to get me to lie and tell you I did. Why don't you guys forget we have four weeks. A lot could happen in four weeks. The world could explode. We don't know what's going to happen. Well, I so, called oh, so, today to get my... So, uh, I assume you're voting for... I mean, you don't have to reveal, but I assume you're voting for Joe Biden. Me? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I hate to... I feel exactly the same as Noam about all the 
shit the left is up to, I hate it. But I can't, I've ne- even last time, I couldn't, I saw Trump's name and I was like, I couldn't. I just couldn't do it. He's just, he's too, he's, he's on a, a, like I said, he's just on his mission, it's too much. And even if he wasn't on that mission, even if I was wrong, which I don't think I am, and that he's not on a death devouring uh, psychological, <laughs> he's so dumb, I just can't take it. Even though what Noam's saying is 100% right. All this wokeness is evil, and but there's just something about him I can't in principle vote for. You know what I mean? They should have gone with somebody else. And that, I mean, I even, even if they were talking about Ibram Kendi. So Ibram Kendi is, I mean, you know, he's, he's a that. hero. Yeah. What? Are we off the debate now, Noam? Because I, I did have- No, one. it's about Trump, right? So Ibram Kendi is a hero to the to liberals and they, they, they he's right. um, the main advisor for various uh, racial sensitivity or anti right, 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 right. And then he comes out talking, you know, talking about how um, white, white people shouldn't be adopting black babies and it's colonialism. And nobody, like this is, per- nobody's asking them to disassociate themselves from <laughs> Ibram Kendi or, or what's clearly racist talk. And then, but and he's like embraced in the in the the, the the highest levels, the hoi poi of of, uh, of the, the Democratic elite party. Right. And Trump right. is supposed to answer for some Nazi loser in his mom's basement who comes out once a year with a dumb T-shirt, you know. And Absolutely. <laughs> but that's like, part of a president. You still have to do it. Suck it up and do it. Yeah, but I'm saying it, yes, he should do it. But what en- enrages me is that. They don't. They don't ever turn that sanctimonious eye and towards themselves. One hundred percent right. Yeah. But that's still. Sometimes you just got to do it, and the fact that he doesn't do it tells you something pretty deep. Yeah. It's not that he's a racist. It's that he's looking to. He's a car. He wants the car to go. He's like the young Thelma and Louise. That's him. So what did you think of him uh, when he said to uh, Biden? He uh, he said that Biden graduated in the bottom of his class. And don't use the word smart around me. I don't know if you. That's you're fine. Doing. I don't mind that kind of stuff. And it's true, by the way. Hey, well, if it's true, it's even funnier. Yeah, B- Biden. Biden lied about everything. He was a terrible student. <laughs> or, or, or about him going after Hunter. He kept, uh, you know, he kept. That's all true too. Yeah, that stuff doesn't bother me. It bothers what? me. What's that? It bothers me. That he goes after Hunter. No, Hunter. The Hunter thing bothers me. Oh yeah, I'm saying it doesn't bother me that he goes after Hunter. Yeah, I mean. Think of it this way, that the Hunter thing is pretty simple. If you presume that all uh, uh, deals are, are if, if, if all deals are presumed to be an even exchange, right? Two people make a deal, you presume they, they, they feel like they're getting an equal. Right? What did Burisma think was their even exchange they were getting from Hunter Biden when they paid him millions of dollars? It could only be influence with the vice president. Absolutely. So that's corrupt on its face. And then when Biden went, now that doesn't mean Biden was going to deliver on it or Hunter could even do it. He might have fooled them. But right. then when Biden goes and plays golf with these guys, right. Biden is kind of giving his tacit approval to the arrangement. Sure. And even if it just means that he knows that his son put millions of dollars in his pocket by kind of selling his father's name, even though he had no intention to ever do anything about it, that's, that's disgusting. Yeah, but that's, it's that's like he said, his son's like, Dad, you don't have to do anything. Just play golf with them. That's Just hear them out. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. If you don't like it, walk away after the game. I mean, I would never, I would never do that. I mean, you know me. I won't even take fucking free tickets. I know. Because I, know. I don't want to owe anybody anything. I know. And, and no, he's- Look, the double standard is complete. I get it. Yeah. yeah. But I'm saying there's still something very, very sick and- uh, Chilling about that about this impulse of this guy, you know. Absolutely. No, he's he's a he's a loose cannon. I mean, we're... it's more than a loose cannon. There's something else. I mean, I was thinking. Yeah, I'm sure many people were as I was watching him last night. I'm like, this guy can go home tonight and and blow up the world. I mean, this, this... exactly. It's like, <laughs> and and if he really understood himself, he'd go. That's the only thing that's gonna make me happy. <laughs> <That's so good. laughs> That's who he is. That's who he is, I feel like, you know. Now, having said all that, it would not surprise me at all that after the election, when he loses, if he loses, that he will actually concede and, and walk away. No way. He's going to incite a riot, the likes of which- Let me tell you why. It's because of what I said before. Because he sees everything in terms of leverage for, for what he wants to get out of it. 
once the deal, as it were, is, is um, done or failed, at that point, you walk away and move on to other things. And, and he postures so much. Don't be surprised if in the end he says, when he realizes it's done, once, he might take it to court, but once he realizes it's done, I expect him to leave. And not only that, I think the half-life on Trump as a cause is very short. I don't think anybody's going to, people forget right. about him very quickly. I hope I you're right. I do not think that's true, but I really hope you're right. My, well, my brother says it best about it because he's living every, he's the hero of all narcissist personalities because everybody's talking about him all the time. It doesn't matter if they're insulting him, attacking him, being nice to him, praising him. All we talk about ever is Trump, Trump, Trump. It's a narcissist's greatest achievement ever. Totally, 100%. Everybody's talking about him all day and all night, all over the world. That's what every narcissist wants. Of course. He's complete personality disorder, megalomaniac, narcissist but personality disorder. For all of them. <sighs> By the way, I think I misused the word. Uh, Quite polite, boy, you did. Boy, I, I, was, boy. I was about to say Her something, but the, the momentum was such that I couldn't get a word in. But yeah, Hoi Polloi is, is lower class. Yeah, I, I, I hear, well, it's just the common folk. But I, but I hear it is it is commonly misused, and I think I picked it up from uh, someone. I misused. think because it sounds like hoity-toity. Yes. And so you confuse the two, much like Trump confused stand down and stand by, arguably. Whoa. <laughs> hey, full circle. Well, it's a callback. It's a common technique. <laughs> is it All good? Right. What else? I That's sent it. you something in the chat. Oh, my well, God. This idea, and the other controversial notion is that he's, it, you know, uh, as we just discussed, that he that that he that he's telling people to go to the polls and um, monitor the situation, and and then people are you know, I know it sounds threatening to people. And Colin, well, listen, there was an article. I'm going to read you something in a second, but this is a Colin yeah. Quinn for president. You you really sprung for the graphic artist on that one. <laughs> hey, that looks good. <laughs> that look good. I like the color combination. Yeah. Uh, let me just uh, talk talk much. I'm gonna read you guys something because it's pretty. It's really worth uh, reading before we go. Go ahead, Dan. Say or Colin. Say something for a second. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, no, I was just bringing up that that you know the idea of Trump telling people that we need we need people at the polls to to, to monitor everything. Right, right, right. Sounds a little bit intimidating and a little bit provocative. Do you think? I mean, do you think voting by mail is like a total farce? Okay, so that's what Zach was. So before, you know, everybody's, everybody's giving Trump a hard time about the mail-in voting. However, this is an article, you can see the URL here. This is, this is 2012. This is um, before, you know, anybody had a stake in it. And the uh, New York Times, and the headline was, error and fraud at issue as absentee voting arises. And then look at this paragraph here. It says, in the last presidential election, 35.5 million voters requested absentee ballots, but only 27.9 million absentee ballots were counted. According to a study, blah, 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 get to the end, it says, um, uh, uh, blah, blah, and that election officials rejected 800,000 ballots. That suggests an overall failure rate of as much as 21%. So back, back before there was any uh, partisan side of these arguments, the New York Times was writing that right. there was an issue and that it could be as much as 21% of the ballots were at issue. And that's before right. it, it tripled in numbers or quadrupled. And that was also before yeah. Trump and the extreme motivation that people have to sure. try to play games. So there is absolutely nothing ridiculous on its face about what Trump is saying, that this mail-in mail ballots is a very, very dangerous path for us to go on. As a matter of fact, you would think if he was good at what he's supposed to do, he would have had that New York Times article as a debate. And he said, listen, this right. is what the New York Times said. Right. When, when it didn't matter, when they didn't have a, a cause or a stake in it. He's not that it, smart. And that's why he doesn't, every, every time you say Trump should have said this or should have done this, the answer is the same. He's just not that good. He's well, somebody should have told him to say something like that. Yeah. But um, so I think the mail-in balance is very risky. Hopefully Biden will win by such a wide margin that it, you know, it, it'll, it'll account for uh, but that even, as well. But uh, even if he's right that the ballots are risky, is he, is he right to say, to, to 
imply, uh, insinuate that he's not going to go quietly? No, I, no, he's not right to do it. I told you why he does it. He does it because he knows from experience that if he keeps the opposition in a frenzy of pressure, uh, that it will likely lead to some opportunity for him. They will, they'll fuck up. They'll say something. They'll do something. They'll find some ballots. Uh, otherwise, he feels like he's not actually fighting for himself. He's just leaving it to the wind. And that's not his style. Isn't this a psychotic, this is like a be, psychotic behavior though. I mean, could you well, imagine talking? It's, 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 he's psychotic behavior himself all the way to the presidency. So you try to tell him that it's psychotic behavior. <laughs> I sound like my father now. Like, like you know, my father, when people would say something, he says, really? Look around you and you try to tell me I'm, I'm wrong. Like, you know, it, it's like, you're going to tell terrifying. me that. Huh? It's terrifying. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, yes, there's something psychotic about him, but on the face of it, it's it's hard to call him as stupid as you'd like to when he did become president. I mean, I don't know that it has anything to do with stupid. I mean, there have been lots of horrendous people in huge positions of. Well, I guess he maybe he's 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 you know he has he has genius in certain areas, and um, no, it's so, I, I say it's because he's the left. Their stupidity got him elected. The yes, fact that they kept, the fact that they kept basically dismissing and ridiculing all the red state people got Trump elected. The thing is, Perry, we we you're absolutely right. We blur stuff. Even I do it um, sometimes. Which is one issue is psychotic is when he's doing stuff which, in my mind, is counter to his own interests. So, for instance, the day after he made a a decent convention speech uh, in 2016, he, he came and got nominated. The first thing he did was talk about Ted Cruz's father killing Kennedy. <laughs> and you say, well, this is like, that's psychotic because there's no, there's no theory that I can come up with where he thought this is what he needed to do for his own benefit. So right. very psychotic. The other element is when he does stuff, which seems uh, that you have extreme disapproval of, you call that psychotic, but I'm not sure psychotic is the word that you mean. You just mean you're really offended by it. But the fact is, it's not psychotic if it's in his own interest and will get him elected. Then it's calculated and smart. You just hate it. No, it's in his own interest in the sense that people will be talking about him that day. It's a narcissist personality. It's not psychotic. It has nothing to do with the election. It has everything to do with people focused on him all day, every day. As long as everybody in the world is saying Trump all day, he can rest peacefully. Yeah. That's like a, a heroin addict saying it's psychotic if they do something crazy, they're going to get heroin. You're like, why would he take a chance like that? He must be self-destructive. No, he wants his heroin. And that's his that's his heroin. Well, our friend Harry Enton thinks it's very unlikely that Trump is going to win. Yeah, I think so too. I well, your friend gonna... Perry Ashenbrand thinks that he has a very good chance of winning. I think he's given most of the nation a twitch, and I think people have had it. Well, my, my, my gut tells me that he has a good chance of winning, but I, I haven't looked at the numbers. Harry has crunched the numbers, and... Uh, Harry's a numbers crunch. You know. I got to call Harry and tell him, sorry, I got to go with Perry Ellen this one, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> it just seems to me when I'm hearing very reasonable, intelligent people like Colin and Noam saying, you know what, I'll, yeah, I'll vote Biden, but... I'm, when you guys are wavering and you guys are thoughtful, intelligent people, imagine, I'm just thinking all these other people that, that might not have the moral qualms about voting, but, you know, that, that they're going to... I'll tell you what's wrong with that. I'm not let all let Colin say what he thinks. I think that Colin and I, um, well, this is the way I see it. People want to pretend that when they vote for one guy, they have to assume that everything about the other guy is horrible. But that's not the truth. The truth is, you're playing averages. You're like a baseball coach. Yeah, this guy hits for power better. He's got a better average. This guy is faster. This guy seems to, in this particular scenario, statistically shows a little bit. So you, you're choosing the one that you think will actually be better. But it doesn't mean that you think the guy you didn't put in there sucks or, or couldn't possibly, in retrospect, be the guy who would be better to win the game. You, you don't know. You're just like, this, this guy chokes. I mean, you, there's a million different situations. And, and I, I don't like Trump for very personal reasons, but I lean more towards 
his take on most issues, especially on the left. I, I don't like Biden, but I feel more comfortable with him and his finger on the button. And I feel more comfortable with him caring about the temperature and the overall well, the psychological well-being of the entire nation. That, that's right. really yeah. Colin, I don't know. Well, I'm going to tell you a story, and it's not a popular one, but it's my take. It was a young man, a painter in Vienna. <laughs> Let's say the late 20s. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No, I agree. So, but but that, that is how you decide. Like, you don't, you don't yeah. know, right? No, I mean, you don't know. listen, if you, if you took COVID out, the COVID hadn't happened, right? And we were coming to the end of the Trump term. Yeah. You would have to say that virtually nobody who was predicting the worst turned out to be correct. They were all, they were all wrong. He didn't get us into a war. He didn't take over. He didn't become a dictator. The economy didn't crash. Paul Krugman was wrong about a permit. Like all the detractors, he didn't, he didn't fuck against the Supreme Court. Even when they voted on his travel ban, he, he didn't blah, blah, blah. He didn't, he didn't end Obamacare. Like all of it, he didn't end gay marriage. You could go through the whole list of everything we heard was gonna happen. Right. None of it happened. So to a smart person, you say, you know what? Why am I gonna listen to those people again this time? What have they gotten right? Oh yeah, and by the way, he was a Russian spy. And yeah. oh yeah, but I mean, oh yeah, the, the FBI had no abuses. Oh yeah, uh, uh, Adam Schiff wasn't lying and Nunez was, was, tell, was full of shit. I mean, what did they tell us that turned out to be true? Absolutely, you're absolutely right. And has there been any consequence whatsoever to these people after four years of getting it wrong? No. None. But, no. But you're 100% right. The only thing I say is from day one, my stomach feels funny whenever yes. he's, since he's been president. And that's a weird thing. Yeah. yeah. Me too. But you just got, there's a discount rate on everybody who says things. And the discount rate on the anti Trump stuff is, is, yeah. is pretty high. You know, he's, he's, yes. whatever. But um, listen, we'll all, be, we'll all be happy to be rid of him. That's for sure. Yeah. I just hope the left doesn't move in and take over because they are terrorists and they they're survive. Gonna, they're going to try, but we'll see what happens. They, 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 they succeed on a, a uh, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, how did it, uh, a asymmetrical tactics where they, they, they demand something. And then if you don't want to give them their demands, they threaten to call you a racist or a bigot or a thing. Yeah, and then you, so com precious. you compromise with them. You negotiate with terrorists and they get something and then they get well, more and then they get more. Yeah, but well, maybe the answer is to, uh, to, to have, you know, to vote Republican in, in the Senate and the house to balance out, you know, what you perceive as, as a guy in the white house that's beholden to the left. That's a good idea. And we definitely need a Republican mayor in New York. My God. Why well, you don't think de Blasio is really holding it together? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, even I can concede that point. I mean, we've had 20 years, we had 20 years of Republican mayors and, and New York was doing pretty good. Yep. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I compared to other cities. I mean, I don't, I don't, whatever. It's better than it is now any, in any event. Yeah. And Koch was almost a Republican. Koch, yeah. Koch would have to be a Republican by today's standards. Yes, he would. What, um, Colin, where can everybody find your book? Well, it was sold, except for the, except for the guy outside the fat black pussy guy with the table. Thank you, Periel. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. Nice, Dan. We, he sh we should give him some copies. Yeah. That guy, because I'll bet he'll sell them. No, I don't want anything to do with him. <laughs> I talked to him once, and ever since then, I, we just right. scowled at each other. Wait, I want, I want to do this publicly for the entire world to see. This is overstated, of course, because I'm buying now with one click. And um, of course, I'm going to buy it on the uh, company card. You know, I'm not an idiot, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've just bought my a, a copy of, Col of Colin Quinn's book. Did you do the audio book, Colin? Yeah. Yes, uh, he did. That's, uh, that's awesome. All right. Well, that was fun. Overstated, guys. And we'll see you next time. Yes. Bye, Bye, Bye Colin. Let's, let's the three of us stay on for a second. Bye, Colin. Bye, okay. Colin. Yeah. We have a little wrap up where we talk about the guests. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, what else, guys? I'm going to get um, Colin no, Quinn for. Do. Sorry, Dan. We, we, we don't usually do this, no. Is no, no. I just, I just uh, wondered what, what you guys want to, if you guys have anything else to say about, about anything. About Colin? No, because I felt like Colin had to go, but uh, you guys weren't done. I, um, 
I want, would you guys be excited if I got us Colin Quinn for president sweatshirts to wear on the night of the election? Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I could use a good quality sweatshirt. I don't care what you put on it. I'd what rather have a Natterman for president. You could, oh. put on, you could put on Perry Alpha president, as long as it's good cotton. <laughs> and it's comfortable. I'm, I, you know. Um, I'm, I'm surprised you weren't more upset about the debate. I, I was really bothered by it. Me or Dan? Dan. Dan is tortured upset by no, I, 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 I was upset, but I also came in expecting worse. I, I expect him, I, you know, I, I was ready for Trump to, to really uh, get even nastier than he did get and to, and to say, call, call, call him Sleepy Joe and to make fun of his stuttering. Like, I, whenever Joe started stuttering, I expected Trump to go, hey, 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 hey. maybe I was confused. That, that was the worst out. debate. I mean, it, not that it was the worst debate I've ever seen in my life. It's, it was not even... Uh, close to there's no second place i mean it's not even like there's not I'm even glad, one horrible I'm debate glad, and that was it i'm glad it disturbed you that much i really am but again i came in expecting worse so i wasn't disturbed. the same and i had the same reaction to trump in general i expected you know as, it, the last four years i thought would be the truth is as you said all the doomsday predictions generally didn't come true with except for a horrible pandemic, which nobody predicted. And, and but, that, um, you, you, well, that some people predicted it. Well, they predicted that one day there'd be a pandemic and we'd be ill-prepared, but it wasn't associated. And they were right. With well, I'm gonna show you guys something before we go, if anybody's still listening, but um, this is, I mean, this is the, the, the reality here, which is that, let me just bring this up here. So, is this the right? Um, yeah, so this is, let me share the screen. Um, and this is why, you know, the case against Trump, why not crazy, is a little bit, um, the lily's gilded a little bit. So this is, as of today, confirm, new confirmed cases, Europe, Europe versus, versus the United States. The red line is the United States. The blue line is the European Union. You see that? Mm -hmm. So the absence of Trump, this is the absence of Trump line. Right. Didn't, it didn't turn out to be uh, quite as um, important as the New York Times might have led us to believe. And by the way, the absence of Cuomo uh, might have put this red line a little bit Cuomo a little bit lower. Now, having said that, um, I I did not control. I didn't do it. I, these are raw numbers. I'm going to do it in a second by per million. But the reason I'm doing it by raw numbers is because the press routinely compared other compared the United States to Europe using our raw numbers, comparing us to all all around using raw numbers. So I think it's only fair to just reverse it. They always should have done it per million. But even per million, which I'm just switching to now, you can see that Europe is clear. This is the trajectory of Europe is up, 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 up here. And the United States has been hovering in this area for, let me lower it here, you can see for, um, you know, a, a couple months already. Wait, am I an idiot or does the United- Yes, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> does the United States look like significantly worse than Europe? The United States was significantly worse than Europe. Like on day 140, you can see my mouse, on day 140, that's when people were writing stuff like Europe has this licked and we're idiots and blah, 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 blah. But by day 220, it's pretty clear that the trajectory here is that Europe looks like they're going to be overtaking it. Europe already has overtaken us in raw numbers. But and of course, still, if, you take out, if you take out Germany, for instance, and the Germans seem to be like preternaturally good at being disciplined and and uh, wearing their masks. Uh, if you take out Germany, I believe Europe would show a much higher number than the United States um, per million people. And, and the question is, is what would Hillary or Joe have done that would have, or uh, that would have made that curve? I, I mean, hopefully they would have gotten us to wear masks earlier. Maybe they would have been better. I'm not saying that, I mean, obviously Trump made mistakes, but Cuomo made, I mean, Cuomo made serious mistakes by not shutting down New York two weeks earlier. That was, tens of thousands of deaths. But anyway, all I'm saying is that it's all a matter of putting in perspective. Yes, Trump made mistakes. Yes, Cuomo made mistakes. But Europe is supposed to be so wonderful. And look what's happening in Europe, which implies a certain inevitability 
to some of this. Now, for instance, we don't, we don't know what it's going to be. And as you said, Europe could overtake us. Yeah. Well, but even, we don't know what the next few months have in store. So the story is not told yet. I mean, it's right. Well, that, but, but they have overtaken us in, in raw numbers, which was the way it was reported quite often. Now, having said that, we add to it that um, somebody I know looked up all the zip codes of all the uh, communities that have been spiking in, in New York and in New Jersey, and they're all, I'm sorry to say this, they're all uh, where Hasidic and Orthodox Jewish communities are centered, which is interesting. That is such a fucking nightmare. Right. So that's, so that's you know, part of that culture. But what's interesting to me is that they're not the only culture where um, the virus spreads and you know, you know, nobody's saying the virus is anti-Semitic, right? We we hear all the the virus is racist, the virus wait is second, bigoted. Wait a second, do you remember when I got called an anti-Semite for yeah. saying that yeah. months ago? Yeah. What I'm saying is that poor communities with high density, with a uh, with a particular laxness of uh, following the rules, like for instance, that there was that article of. Uh, Flushing and Corona Queens and Flushing is like all Asian and have like a hundred percent mask wearing and it was almost like zero COVID there. Well, what you're and, saying is that culture matters and so yeah, and, and then right next door you can look at it right next door is Corona Queens, which is a lot of the Hispanic, and they weren't wearing masks so much and had a much, much higher rate of of COVID. And so people would take that high rate, say, oh, the virus is is bigoted, you know. The but the truth is that the Jews are capable of the same uh, uh, sloppy adherence to, to protocols. And they're worse than anybody. You know, and, and I mean, no one has, you can't talk about it out loud, right? You got called an anti-Semite. I got um, called an anti-Semite, it was horrible. I vaguely but, remember that. I don't know, were you called an anti-Semite or, or, or were you told that you were saying things that uh, had sh shades of anti-Semitism? I got uh, called uh, an you, anti- You, you, you were expressing, yeah, what you said was a little, Bug me a little bit too. I don't think you're an anti-Semite, but the way you put it- I said it, exactly what you just said. No, the difference is when you're- I'm just stating the facts because I think that we shouldn't be afraid to state the facts. And, and very often just stating the facts of what is real will get you in hot water. You are expressing a kind of uh, uh, um, distaste for them. Uh, no, 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 no. Yes, you are. No, I was expressing a distaste for the fact that they refused to social distance and refused to wear masks and were getting together in large groups. That right. I expressed. Right, but if I, but if I were to show you a picture of a of um of a minority area, Indian, Black, or whatever, virtually any other minority group under the sun with exactly oh. the same thing, you would never say such things. Oh shit! Of course I would. Oh come on. You would never express that kind of distaste. You would talk about how they're that 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 they're um, underprivileged, yeah. how it's our fault, how you don't. I mean, you you, you would no, say no bullshit. And, and by the way, and you'd be right about some of those things. Don't get me wrong. I, they, some of that stuff would absolutely be true. Back in April, when I was frantically scouring around with bunches of other people getting masks to doctors in hospitals that didn't have masks. You could have showed me a picture of anyone under the sun who was not following those protocols and I would have been enraged. And I continue would, to would feel have that condemned way. them individually, but would you have condemned them as a group? Uh, I, I think Noam is correct. You would not have. No, oh, please. And, and Listen, those are those are my people, those Jews, and it, and it bothers me. I know that it's true. I know that they, and by the way, it's also not it's not biblically required. They're, they they absolutely do not have to go to shul, or they do not have to take any risks uh, when faced with with disease. So it's not it's not the religion which is requiring them to do it. You know, my, I'm still sharing the screen. I'm sorry. It's that um that that gathering is so deep within their lives, they just can't bear to be without it. And, you know, I, I get that. You know I, what, I, Noam? We are I, all suffering and we all miss our lives and we all miss our friends and we all miss our rituals. I've been, you know, virtually 
seeing no one for seven months. I would also like to go to parties with my friends and go get together. I'm not doing any of that shit. And it, it's fucking irresponsible and it's selfish and it's really shitty because it's because of whoever's doing that. I don't want to say people like them. What I mean like them is people who are not following those protocols that we're all still in this situation. And as a Jew, maybe I do take it even more personally because it makes us look terrible. Ah, you're worried you about what the, what the Goyim think. <laughs> of course, that, 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 that explains a lot of your opinions on things. Listen, I, I, explain, I, I say that explains most of your opinions on Israel, on, on Judaism, and all of it. It's a, you're, you're worried about what the outside world thinks. Some of them think. Yeah, I, th I really believe that. But, but I anyway, let me just say, I want to go back to what you said about being selfish. So there is a selfishness to people who could get this and pass it on to outsiders. But, but that's not the whole story because you also have to understand that they are taking risks with their own lives. They're taking risks with their families' lives. They don't. And they don't so, so, you, so there is, if you want to understand it, there is something psychological going on here, which is the, the, the pull of this life that they lead, this routine ritual life, which is they're human. Social, social things are very, very, very important to humans. And they are ready to, it's like, you know what? We, if, if it means living for a year without our Jewish life, as we know it, we don't want to do it. We'd rather take the risk. That's not, you can, you can portray that in an ugly way, but there's a poignancy to that. It's not an you evil thing. The they're, not saying, let, that. they're not saying, let's get this. We don't give a shit. As a matter of fact, we're immune to it, but we're going to pass it off, pa pass it on the, on the Italians. It's like, yes, this is dangerous for us. Some of our own have died. You know uh, what the problem is with that logic? Is that then they're going into the hospitals and putting the doctors and the nurses at risk and everybody else. So that poignancy is lovely. And like, I'm, I, I'm not even saying that snidely. Like, I think you're right. There is something really profound about that. But we okay, also but have, there's a responsibility. And like, I just think that it's really like, that's what it comes down to. It's very, very simple. All right, Perry. Well, I, I want to see you, you, you know, do some online research because there are other communities that have stories like this, you know, and, um, you know, the New York Times did a whole thing about who, which communities are wearing masks and which ones are not. And then next week, you can tell us the other communities that you, that you feel are selfish and irresponsible. Okay. And then we'll see how that goes. Well, right now um, <laughs> in the Orthodox communities, there's an 11% rate of um, COVID. No. 11%. No, no. There's eleven. You may, maybe the testing are, is eleven percent. That's not. That's not. The, that's not the same thing as eleven percent of the people having it. There's an eleven percent infection infection rate in some of the Orthodox communities. Can you put that up on the screen right now? I could try to find it. All right. I I think that what you're saying is that the the, the testing rate is ten percent, which that's the that's the number of people who get tested. That's usually people who, uh, for whatever reason, think they might they might have it. But anyway, I, I mean, I, I I'm not I'm not happy with them. CNN, New York sees startling uptick in COVID nineteen cases in Orthodox Jewish community. Yeah. Um, CNN, NBC, New York sees coronavirus clusters pop up in. Orthodox Jewish communities. I mean, yeah, I know that. I brought that up. The question is, where's the ten percent of the community having one it? Second. Jesus Christ. Me, Jesus Christ. Yeah, because then you change the I'm whole time. I'm not. I'm not. You looked it up. You looked it up and start reading out loud something as if I had not been the, the guy who brought it up to begin with. Fine. One second. <laughs> Dan, this is, a, this is a good time to say again that Periel's husband is a saint. I know oh, this man. For the love of God. This you, man is. Have you met Periel's husband? I've never many met times, him. Yes. Have I met him? I don't think I have. Yeah. The, um, we, we families uh, are very close now. What's the rate? Okay, whatever. We'll find it. 
Well, I'll tell you what, I know, I, I know some folks, I'm not going to mention names, that find Periel rather alluring. <laughs> Just from what I hear, you know. Well, thank you, Dan. I know some young ladies who feel oh, the same. Oh, thank goodness that's neither me nor her husband. <laughs> um, from the New York Times, from yeah. the radical left-wing New York Times, yeah. um, officials this week raised, released statistics, statistics, excuse me, showing that the positive positivity rate in some Orthodox Jewish neighborhoods had grown to anywhere from three to six percent, significantly more than the city's overall rate of between one and two percent. So I yes. was wrong, but I was more right. But, of but also the positivity rate doesn't mean, the positivity rate is, is how, what percentage of people who take the test come okay. out positive. That is not the same as saying that three to six percent of the general public has it. People, people, people are self-selecting who take tests. You know, if they're, not doing, if they're not doing a random sample, to, they should, but they're not testing a random sample of the population. You know what I'm really sick of? Yeah. Every time I make a statement like that, and then you make me look it up, I'm always wrong by like a significant margin. <laughs> well, keep you on your toes. Maybe, maybe it'll be more precise in the future. The, the best, the best part about what you just said is that you actually read these articles. And I have no idea what they say. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I arrogantly say, that's just not right. It's just based on my own inference uh, of, of uh, the world around me. And you actually, this is- Well, I did the same thing last week or two weeks ago when Perry, I was saying that social media has caused a huge increase in suicide among teenagers. And I, and I, I without knowing, I just figured, well, Perry, I was saying it and it sounds extreme. So I'm just going to say, no way. And, <laughs> and um, when I looked it up, uh, Indeed, the jury is still very much out on, on, there is more suicide, but the jury is still very much out on whether or not that's because of social media. Did you watch that? Did you watch The Social Dilemma? I haven't done yet. Okay, so I really want you guys to watch that. This is the thing. Imperial says something, and unless, unless she knows it exactly, you know, within, 10, within two decimal places, the exact fact correct, you have to assume there's an over-under. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you that you, you, know, you never lose taking the under, okay? You just never lose taking the under at Periel. You can, you can win money all day long just by betting the under on anything Periel says. Dan, have you been doing outdoor shows? Um, uh, no, but I have one scheduled. Actually, I put in for Friday. I don't know if they're going to give it to me. But Friday, uh, it, right now, predicting rain, so it may not happen. But... Um, Yes, so I may be in the park on Friday, assuming that I get it, I get the spot that I put in for, and assuming it's not raining. I'll be in Central Park on Friday. What time uh, and where? Oh, it'll be Sheep's Meadow at 6 p.m., I think, but that's, you know, again, I don't know. Okay, but, but well, Stand people might want to know. You know, follow Stand Up New York on Instagram, and you'll get all their outdoor, they're doing a lot of outdoor shows, and people really seem to like them. And, and I, normally I wouldn't plug another club, except that Noam has no interest. In, in, in pursuing outdoor shows, so fuck it. What know. does that have to do with my interest in seeing you promote them? I don't want to know about it. No, I'm just saying you're not competing. You're not even trying to compete with them. Should I? I don't know. Well, if I don't know. If it's too late anyway, because with the weather and the early sunset, they're going to stop doing it soon anyway, I think. Um, I don't know how much longer you can do outdoor shows as the temperature starts to drop. Maybe maybe through October you could. I don't but think you can drive in shows. I don't know if you can do it. Yeah, but again, by the way, just remind me, you know, what if, what if one thing Trump didn't say yesterday when, listen, he, Trump was saying some stuff about the virus, which I think a lot of people in the middle, you know, between the 60% the in the middle of the two twenty percent wonder about, which is he was saying, listen, people want to get back to their lives in some way. They know what's safe now. They know how to take care of themselves. They know how to decide things for themselves. And they kind of want their lives back. I think a lot of us feel that way. We're not sure how we feel about it. And what I thought Trump should have said, because it is, 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 it's worth reminding everybody, this was presented to us as bending the curve. Does everybody remember that? Flat this was never, what's that? Yes, I remember. Yeah, the lockdown was never presented to us as we're gonna stay inside and wait for a vaccine. The lockdown was, and we remember the curves, we have to keep the rate of infection within what the hospitals could handle. That was the goal. 
and there was significant mission creep that once we did that and we did it with a, with a very comfortable margin, we forgot that that's what we initially sold it on. We forgot that we were supposed to, once we bend the curve, then live within the curve. We were prepared to do that. Um, and Trump is on pretty firm ground there, actually, if you want to go back to what the logic of uh, enlightened people was back at that time. He's not saying anything in contradiction to what they had initially spelled out as what the goals were to be here. And if, if Trump had said what I just said, that would have been a very, very powerful debating point. He, Biden would have not had an answer to that. And, uh, and I think that, you know, maybe he, what happened he will to get that? it. What happened to that? Where, what, where did that idea disappear? Of course, it sort of, look, I mean, I don't think it's necessarily wrong to change a strategy if you feel upon reevaluation that, that it's better to just stay inside, um, but at least acknowledge that indeed you've changed the strategy and you've changed the goal. No, I mean, I mean, and you know, to blow my own horn, when I was wondering whether or not to close the comedy cellar, and I, I might have told you this, so I was in, emailing with Yasha Mauk, you know, writes with Atlantic, name dropping, but because he wrote, because he wrote some important columns about, you know, shut everything down. And I asked him what he thought, and he thought it was very important that we shut down. And he convinced me, and that's why, he, he, that was largely why I shut down early. But um, what I did write to him in an email, and I saw a reason I said, but you know what, Yasha, when it comes time to reopen, there's never going to be a good time. I said that because once, once that's it, I said once, once reopening means upping the amount of death, it's likely we're going to be reluctant to do that. So I, 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 I recognized even then that this would likely happen. But for whatever that's worth, it's still, that doesn't mean that Trump is wrong because we do need to get on with our lives and people, and we do have a lot of information now and people who are at high risk are way better able now to keep themselves safe than they, they were back then. And people who are at low risk, low risk have way more confidence that they're at low risk. I mean, some, people, some people's risk of dying from coronavirus is no different or less than their risk of dying from the flu. So there's, there's large numbers of people who are saying, I'm staying inside now for something which is no riskier to me than the flu. Would you, re well, like, at all these laws and everything notwithstanding, would you feel comfortable opening the cellar? No, I don't feel, it's weird, like, I don't feel comfortable. I'm worried about it. I'm not, I'm not eager to go down in a basement. I'm older. But, when I'm, but just because I don't feel comfortable doesn't mean it's right. When, you, when you're reacting to something that you feel comfortable about, it's very, very um, unreliable decision making you're doing you're, you're just reacting on your gut like i talk about like when my when my wife sees a kidnapping in iowa and now she doesn't want to let our kids take the bus and it's real what she's feeling is visceral she 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 just can't bear to let the kids she's afraid but that's a, so she's not comfortable but the question is is it rational the question is is it rational and where do you where are you going to draw the line of what's rational i don't know i don't know i I, I, I think that, like, I don't think it's crazy that they opened the colleges. Well, they, uh, I don't think that's crazy. Shut down? I don't think they have, but, like, if you have, you have colleges and you let, the, you let the kids who have high risk stay home, we know that if 20,000 kids get it, uh, you may not even have any deaths. 20,000 kids without, without pre-existing conditions, you might, not have, you might not have any deaths. So, you know, you to open the colleges and let the kids decide and give them the option to stay home. That's not crazy to me. I don't know whether I would go. I don't know whether I would send my kid. I know some people who have sent their kids. I know people have sent their kids to college. We know people who send their kids to school. My nephew went and he got COVID and, but he recovered quickly yeah. uh, with, with, with little uh, difficulty, but. Uh, wow. That's crazy. My, my niece and my nephew are both doing remote over, overseas remote. It's yeah, my kids are home. My kids are doing remote. I'm not sending them because, because I'm able to do it. And also because I don't have a single kid. I have three kids. So they, they, they have a social life together. We have a backyard. But if I was alone in an apartment with one kid and I had to weigh this misery that this kid was going to face for the next, you know, for a year yeah. against, against taking a really, really remote risk. It's, you, when, you, when you say it out loud with his life, it sounds like, well, if you're saying a risk with his life, 
then you should, then obviously you know your answer. You don't do it. But of course, every time you get in a car, every time you take a plane, yeah, every, you let them do a trampoline. I mean, this but is But schools are opening and then they're closing, as you know. I mean, they're opening and then they're closing right down because people are getting it and teachers are at risk. And it's not just, I, you know, it's not just the remote chance that a child- well, They're closing to clean or whatever it is. They're not closing. No, to clean. they're closing because people are getting COVID. Yeah. What was that? They're closing until there's a vaccine, that's it? I don't know. Well, nobody knows. That's the thing. Nobody knows. And, and I guess all I'm saying is that neither side is crazy. The people who want to- The people uh, who aren't wearing masks, who are refusing to wear masks because they think their rights are crazy. being infringed upon that's, are crazy. That's crazy. Well, you know how I feel about that. But let me, let me just say, to go, to go back and then we'll end. When people were saying we need to bend the curve, do you recall anybody saying at that time, no, 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 no. Bending the curve is not enough. We need everybody to stay home until this is over. You're right. I don't matter. No, Nobody was saying that, right? If it's so fucking obvious, not one smart person, it didn't occur to anybody. To everybody who heard it says, yeah, we're going to bend the curve. That, that made perfect sense to everybody. And now we, we don't have the nerve. Also, now we're used to, we're used to being yeah. inside. It, it, it doesn't seem, it seems like, okay, I guess we can do this. No, we're, but there's something else, Dan. And this is, this is I, 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 I left this unsaid. Now there is a partisan aspect to all this, that it, it is a way of hating Trump if you oppose any easing up on the lockdowns. That is real. Trump represents easing down on the lockdowns. And that, from that, people are reacting into extreme positions about the lockdowns that they never had and never occurred to them prior to the time when this became this issue. That's what I'm saying. It's political now. Yeah, but, you, right. but before it was political, people didn't see it. And that's, and that's always a big warning sign. That's why I bring up the New York Times from 2012. Before it was political, the Times saw 20% of the absentee ballots as risky, maybe disqualifiable. Now that it's a partisan issue, you're not going to see a, Times, a story like that in the Times anymore. They pretend they never wrote that story. Actually, it's interesting that you, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that I haven't seen that article, that nobody's on Facebook has posted it. It's the first I've seen it, yeah. to be honest. And, I, and by the way, I, I would hesitate to post it on Facebook. Just post <laughs> the article without commentary, without anything. Yeah. No commentary, nothing at all. Just to post an article that says absentee ballots are sketchy on Facebook would earn me the wrath of many people, and so I wouldn't even post an article without comment, which is, by the way, is pretty bad. Pretty bad that that's how I feel. Well, know? that's right, and that's why voting for Biden is, is it's not Biden, it's, it's, it's giving them an inch. The people that are responsible for that misery that we face, we can't, we can't, we can't speak freely, we can't post stuff on Facebook, we're worried about our friends, and it's like, you know, uh, and you, you, God forbid, I mean, look, To personalize it, like you know, I I I have a half black stepson. He's he's he don't, he don't look black. Not that that should matter, but but you know, just full disclosure, he, he looks more like Puerto Rican or Hispanic or something. Definitely looks minority or something. And you know, and 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 I and we raised him. Me and his in his um Indian mom, Indian Puerto Rican mom. He wasn't raised by anybody African American. And to hear to to vote for this ideology that talks about that relationship and that idea uh, in that way, you know, is, is not very different for me than voting for right, white supremacy. It is not. I mean, the stuff that they're saying, I take it personally. I, I adopted a black child, you know, fuck them. What the fuck do they know about what, what that, that I'm not, what are they, I mean, who, how dare them, how dare they talk this way about this woman who saved, a, saved children who were probably starving in an earthquake. Did Ibram Kendi go and adopt, help any uh, Haitian children? I mean, the, 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 the nerve, the disgusting nerve of it. And these people are heroes, heroes in the Democratic Party. Just nobody has the nerve to call them out on it. So, you know, that's how I feel. Anyway, okay. Um, should we end it? But I, I no, no, we, 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 we're done. We're, we're, we're way over okay, time. Actually. So we'll see you next time.
uh, podcast at comedysaw.com for suggestions, comments, and queries. And we'll see and you next time. Watch us on YouTube and listen. Dan does not hesitate. Bye. He is, he is really, I mean, not not delicate. And you can follow us at Live from the Table on Instagram. Good night. And vote. <laughs>